Hey guys, hold on. There we go. You get to see my hand for a minute. There's a connection. Hey guys, it is Thursday, June 28th. Welcome to the TED Show. Uh, let us know you can hear us or see us. Look at that color, Kevin. It looks good, right? Yeah, it we looks look good. good. I look, we both look young. I mean, yeah, you look good and you can't fix ugly. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> well, that's my problem. All right, let us know you can hear us or see us. Obviously, I'm here with my uh, friend, the amazing Kevin Barry. Um, but I don't want him to start talking because we have a lot to talk about until I get the thumbs up from you guys that you can hear us and see us. Um, it's really going to be a great show. I'm pretty excited about this. Actually, hey, Jackie, uh, give us a thumbs up. Let us know you can hear us or see us. See how it scrolls and you can tell who's on. This is new stuff. It's good stuff, right? Good technology. Good old Jackie Brocky. I love Jackie. Oh, Jackie's been on. Great people. My wife, San Stacy, let us know you can hear us or see us. Uh, she picked this outfit out today. We got a thumbs up. All right, so first of all, I'm really honored to have you on the show. Uh, I've, I've wanted to have you on the show for a while. I, I love what you did for Orange County. Uh, I love what you've done since, and I think that you are a voice for a lot of people who, um, Mike says, Sheriff, please run again. A voice <laughs> for a lot of people who are concerned. We live in a different world even than when you left in 2009. That's correct. Uh, so anyway, welcome. Well, thank you, Ted, for having me. And uh, uh, I, I was told they, people need to know a little bit about me. I've been, uh, I'm a law enforcement family, uh, five generations of law enforcement in my family. I married into five generations of Presbyterian missionaries. Wow. And uh, I've got uh, two sons that are cops, a daughter that served in Afghanistan, Iraq, and North Africa with the, uh, she's a Navy corpsman assigned to the Marines. Wow. And I still got one college tennis player daughter who goes to college up in North Carolina and uh, and then maybe I'll think about slowing down a little bit. <laughs> yeah because it's not like so you went in did you go to public service right away when you uh, you always knew growing up that you wanted to be a police officer you're gonna laugh I, w I wanted to be a baseball player really but I had a friend of mine who was uh, uh, de uh, it was December 31st 1975 uh, a friend of mine talked about committing suicide I never knew it walked in on him Took a gun away from his head, unloaded it, and from that time on, I gave up baseball and became a cop. Wow. See, the tra trajectory of your life changed. But your son played baseball, correct? Uh, uh, both of them. Yeah, uh, they both played uh, baseball. One, uh, Robert, who's a cop up in Apopka, played on the national championship team back-to-back -back for the Garnet and Black uh, up in South Carolina in 10 and 11. And then my son, John, played for Marshall. So you had kids that played, you, they, you instilled the passion in them, obviously. And since everybody except your younger, what did you refer to, tennis playing daughter, uh, <laughs> is in public service, is in the service, is in the police or military or security for sure. Um, but it seems like you instilled that in your family too. Well, and, and I, I tell her because she's, uh, she's kind of like you, Ted, she's getting into that media world. Oh, the media world. And she wants to be a writer, and I figured I might get a war correspondent <laughs> out of this one. <laughs> That's right, because you're a correspondent everywhere, and I want to <laughs> talk about that. All right, but so you became a cop, and then what led you to eventually run for public office? Because you were Orange County Sheriff from 93 to 2009, is that right? That's correct. Uh, see, I do research, guys. Uh, 93 to 2009, what led you to go, all right, I want to run. I want to be um, the actual sheriff of Orange County. Actually, I was at Kennedy Space Center in charge of their SWAT team. And I went to the funeral of Tom Ingram, who was killed by a drunk driver out on East 50. And uh, multiple, when I say numerous, they were numerous deputies at the funeral. And uh, they came up to me and said, we want you to run for sheriff. And... Uh, I did in 1992, and nobody gave me a chance. And I, uh, you know, family went through threats and all that kind of stuff. And uh, they said, there's no way you'll beat a incumbent. Well, we beat them 58 to 42. Wow. Well, there are obviously there are people who were looking for change. Right? Well, I, th I think that was part of it. And I think uh, uh, we're gonna start, uh, there, there's a need for that in Central Florida today because uh, I think there's some need for fresh faces in Florida and in Central Florida particularly, law enforcement wise, um, all the way through uh, the people that are running our uh, different cities and 
in, in, in the area. And what do you think, so, so much, I have so many questions, you have lots of comments and lots of love, by the way. Jackie wanted you to talk about the helmet you designed. Uh, one of your friends on there, I think, just said he wonders what you'd look like in my jacket and shirt. Uh, <laughs> so well, we got, you got a good good group of people on. Well, the, <laughs> I, I was I still do some consulting for Point Blank. Point Blank's helmet was the one that saved the officer at the pulse, and uh, he was shot directly in the head, and the helmet saved his life. Wow! And uh, I'm I'm proud that uh, I had the opportunity to work with him full time, and now as a consultant, because uh, I like all that life saving stuff. You know, those are kind of things that irritate you because those, the helmets were one of the things that Obama took away from law enforcement mm -hmm. when he shut down the uh, 1033 program. You know, everything was focused on, oh, we're looking too military, uh, we don't want you to have any MRAPs and armored vehicles. Well, folks, when you've got uh, bombs going off and uh, rifle rounds coming into you, you sure don't want to be in some soft skin Impala. Right. You want something that has some guts around it. Right. And, uh, and if you're going to go into an active shooter role, sure it would be nice to have Kevlar helmets on our cops. And let's talk about the active shooter role. I mean, we have so much to talk about. I'd love to talk about your entire uh, tenure as sheriff. But 2009, you leave, and you the world is different, obviously, than it was in 2003. But so much has also changed since 2009. Um, what do you see as the biggest difference? What has been your biggest challenge? Because you're a big proponent of so many positive things in our country, and I, I follow your social media. I think the things that you put out there, you're, it's from the heart, right? I love that. And I think people want to hear that. I think people want to hear because they're feeling unprotected. They're also feeling like they don't know what to do, where to get their information from. But you have a perspective that goes all across the spectrum. Well, uh, I will tell you that uh, the threat of terrorism is something that we have to get real with. I'm glad to see that the Supreme Court supported the Trump travel ban. Folks, I've got friends, dear friends that are mine that are Muslim. A lot of them protected me for six years, and they weren't going to let anything happen to the old man in Afghanistan. But the bottom line is uh, we need to have that travel ban because there are concerns, for, especially from those countries that are affected, that even the Obama administration identified as concerning countries. You need to vet those people because they're not, when they're not vetted, they come in and that's who our next Mateen is going to be. And you're talk, and I don't, if people didn't get a chance to read your bio, you're talking from a place not just from being Orange County Sheriff and doing consulting, but you've traveled to Afghanistan. You worked there for six years. Um, tell them a little bit about what that's like, because that obviously gives you a real perspective of what's going on. Well, I can tell you, I know what it's like to hear that click and the, the whoosh of the wind uh, when that uh, IED goes off. Uh, I had several of them that uh, uh, happened around us, while the closest being about 300 yards from camp. Wow. And uh, that's not what you want to see. I remember having it at 6.15 in the morning sending three of my medical people and 12 security people down to the camp about a quarter mile away where they're putting the pieces and parts of six dead bodies and trying to save the lives of 16 others that were hit with a motorcycle bomb. It is not a, a thing that we want to see in this country and people need to realize we need to protect our borders. And do you feel like it's really because, we talked a little bit about the summer and if you want to share some of that, what your anticipation is, you feel like that's, it's not, getting better, like we're gonna expect worse. It's just gonna be something but we have to accept. I No, I, I, I will tell you, in this country today, whether you're Republican or Democrat, Independent or whatever, let's get, a, let's get some happy medium ground and let's start working together. Stop the hate, stop the hate rhetoric. You're putting people at uh, peril. And I'm gonna tell you, if I was a, a law enforcement leader today, I would tell you, to get ready for a long, hot summer because as the numbers dwindle, uh, especially to the far left, I think you're gonna see these hate groups like Antifa and others, they're gonna come out and they're gonna take violence to the street again. And uh, if you're a law enforcement leader, it's time to get some intestinal fortitude and uh, I'm uh, sure suck. what you were going to say there. Yeah, I, <laughs> Ted, I told you I uh, wouldn't slip. Oh no, it's uh, all right, you can slip any time. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it, it kind of tells me you got to have some guts. Yeah. And we have too many leaders at every level, federal, state, and local, that are wimps. And they don't want to make the tough decision. They don't want to make the timely decision. They want to make the politically correct decision. 
And you can't do that, especially in a life-saving situation. You don't have time in an active shooter to sit and sing Kumbaya and have a uh, meeting at the round table. You need to be able to go in, stop the threat, stop the dying, immediately start working on saving lives and then clear the incident. And uh, we could learn a lot from uh, the Israelis and what they do. And you actually are teaching an active shooter class. Talk about that. Yes, it's called Active Shooter Incident Management. It's done by C3 Pathways. They are uh, contracted with Texas A&M. They're going all over the country to teach active shooter incident management to law enforcement leaders, to uh, fire service, and as well as emergency medical service. And folks, it needs to expand. It needs to include school teachers as well as school administrators. And how about mayors and governors and things like that? Because you tell me what training does a mayor get in active shooting management? I don't, and I'm I'm actually amazed when you were, we were talking, we had a great conversation beforehand, so um, I'm amazed at the fact that there isn't that level of training. You would think after everything, after all the stuff that's happened, even since 2009 and before, that we would have better training for our public officials, for people who work in public places, just all the way down, because I think people really don't know how to react. Look what happened down in Parkland, look what happened here, and we talked a little bit about that with Pulse. With Pulse. It, there isn't the training there. Well, th there's training. You, you need to have the Unified Incident Command training. You need to have the ACM class, which we're training. But uh, also, uh, you, everybody, and this takes leadership in a county. For instance, Seminole County, Dennis Lima, the sheriff there, has trained the entire county on how to respond to a school situation in Seminole County. And Ted, that's the way it needs to be done. It can't be half-baked like what happened in Broward County. Because what you're saying is all of Seminole County has a unified training. Everybody across the board has the same training. And what you're saying is that we don't have that, out, well, in, not in our Orange or another county. I'm just asking. Yeah, and, and that's exactly right. Okay. You need to be well-trained. It needs to be unified so everybody's on the same sheet of music. Gotcha. Okay. And so what do you see as the biggest thing like a citizen um, misunderstands about security and, and um, an active shooter? Because we see it. I think we get de desensitized by it on the news. Okay, that happens somewhere else. And I don't feel like people really know what to do. They don't know how to react. They think they should lock the door, but sometimes that's not uh, doable. What are some of the things that you can tell them that they could do? Just basic life-saving techniques. Well, I, I, I will tell you that, Ted, one, if you hear something, I remember solving some major crimes over hearing people talking about something or somebody that is gonna do harm to somebody at a restaurant. If you hear something like that, call the cops and let them know. Don't hesitate. Mateen at the Pulse shooting, he was, you know, he was on social media and things like that. If you have some concerns, call the authorities. Now, I wouldn't call the FBI because they seem to lose those kind of uh, uh, leads until they uh, get it cleaned up. But, uh, and folks, it, it sh I, I'm, I'm FBI trained. Counterterrorism, National Academy, National Executive Institute, it hurts my heart to see the game plan that's going up there in Washington, D.C. now. I'm for cleaning out the house and letting some of those new 35,000 agents that I've worked hard to continue to keep us protected move into the leadership roles. Lead, follow, or get the hell out of the way. So what would you do different here? What, what would you implement here first or second based on your training, based on your visual, vision after you left? You've obviously gained a ton more experience, not that you didn't already have it, but what would you say since the world has changed? The cha it really has changed even in the last couple of years. What would you say that we need to implement first? How do we, is it protect, is it giving our police force uh, better tools? Is it uh, giving our police force the support? What is it that you see that we need to do? Well, I, I think uh, one, I think uh, the plight of the, the red and the blue line, that's the fire service and law enforcement, because firefighters are getting attacked just like cops. Yeah. They had two shot this past week in another state. Uh, you need to get out there and support uh, those people that protect you. I would pay attention to uh, uh, the fact that what you hear on some of the fake news 
is uh, exactly what that is. It's fake news. Uh, don't be so quick to criticize until all the facts are in and the investigation is done. Uh, folks, it's not getting any better out there. You know, we can sit up there and talk about, oh, the crime rate's great. I don't go anywhere in Central Florida without at least one and usually two guns. Why is that? Somebody trained like you, why do you do that? Is there that much of a, a, a fear, might not be the right word, concern that something is going to happen around you that you think it's going to happen at any moment? Oh, ab uh, absolutely. Uh, once a cop, always a cop. And, uh, you know, just like yesterday in Northwest Orange County, uh, a lady uh, rolled down her window to uh, allegedly give directions and they ripped off her purse. And then what happens? The cops aren't allowed to go after them because they're not allowed to chase. We have got so many policies and procedures in place to handcuff the cops. That's one of the concerns I got. And that's, and that's from all the different uh, law enforcement agencies. And I, I got to throw in my plug uh, on, on the blue line. Folks, you've got one uh, law enforcement group that says we don't need warriors as cops. Well, let me tell you something. I'm all for the guardian style police officer. But when there's an active shooter at one of the schools, if it ever happened here in Orange County, you want that warrior to be able to swip, uh, turn on that switch and go in and protect your child. We don't need to be sitting out here sucking a thumb and singing Kumbaya. We definitely don't want them to be that way. But why do you think? Is it because, uh, do you feel like we've be, we have um, taken away the power or taken away so many of the things because we're trying to make cops be less, uh, to the public, less threatening? And so what that's done is it's completely taken away their authority and their ability to do their job. I, I think we got to get back to some different approaches. I'm, I'm all for neighborhood policing. Uh, I, I used to get beat up because I had midnight basketball. But when I had midnight basketball, I knew where about 1,250 kids were on a Friday and Saturday night. And my wife was up in South Apopka with my youngest daughter participating in midnight basketball. So, you know, there are things that uh, citizens can do to help law enforcement. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you ask what, what people need to do, protect yourself. You know, not everybody feels safe with a, uh, you know, not everybody wants a gun. But if you're gonna choose to have a gun, keep it safely secured, but go out and train with it. Right. And, uh, and, uh, and then, as I tell people, uh, there was a four-step process for me uh, at the house. First, you gotta get through uh, my wife's dogs, and they're all <laughs> drop-offs, so they would bark. Second, you gotta get through the alarm. Third, you gotta get through my wife. And she loved it when I said that my wife is uh, six nine, three hundred and five pounds, and plays for the Buccaneers on the weekend. All right, because she's not going to let anything happen to that grandchild or any of her kids. But lastly, you wake me up at two o'clock in the morning, and you uh, are in my house, and you're threatening me. I'm gonna put something on your butt. Ajax won't take off, and it won't be a butter knife or an ass baton. It'll be a Glock twenty one. Right. You know, so I think what it is, people who don't, who aren't familiar with guns, they, the people that I know, I, I, I know that they are, there's a fear. Um, what's the best way to get somebody integrated into that? How do you teach someone to not fear that, not fear having that gun as a protection? Well, uh, you know, there are all kind of courses, uh, Ted. You know, everybody wants to belittle and terrorize the NRA. But the NRA is the largest training center for law enforcement. That's who they turn to to uh, get their people qualified as, uh, you know, uh, law enforcement uh, training, firearms trainers and things like that. So, uh, you know, there's that. And there, there are actually survival classes being taught. Uh, I know a one you have to get selected to go to the uh, one in Colorado, but they're taking regular old citizens like you and me, let's forget being cops and all that, but regular people and training them on how to react in case something happens in front of you. Wow.
And I think we need that. Like, I think people are afraid. They, like we talked about earlier, they get all their information on social media. And so if you're one side or the other and you're just listening to the one side, you're not doing yourself any justice either way. I don't care what side of the fence you're on. But talking to somebody and listening to somebody like Kevin, you, can, you know that he's got the experience. This isn't somebody who's just writing about it. He's lived it and continues to live it on a daily basis. What do you think some of the challenges are um, internationally since you have, you've got that too? Well, uh, one is uh, I think we need more people in the State Department that uh, have, are, are under the current agenda. I work for the State Department uh, or under the State Department under the last administration. And uh, they had 26-year-old uh, kids out of college running law enforcement programs because mommy and daddy gave to Hillary Clinton's campaign. I don't think that's what we need in our State Department. We need some people in there with real experience, set the goals and objectives for some of these other countries to uh, you know, attain and get to it. But you need to hire the right people to get it done. And uh, I will tell you, I, I watch the Afghan cops. They get $160 a month. All right, we got them, so DEA authorized some training for them to do uh, basic investigations, uh, uh, vehicle interdiction, and search tactics. Right before the last election, Ted, the one, one of those $160 gate cops saw a truck around midnight come in with uh, vegetables, and there was wires hanging out of the vegetables. So he stopped and investigated three miles of uh, U.S. mill grade A debt cord Wow! for over a hundred suicide vests. And you know what? I watched that cop feel real good about himself. Sure. Uh, the, the DEA gave him a 13 cent medal, a piece of paper, and a $300 uh, uh, bonus. And you thought he, uh, he could probably run for emperor of Afghanistan and win <laughs> right now because that's how proud he was. Wow. And I think here in the United States, we take things for granted. We do. And, uh, but there are, there are other countries that want our freedom. They want a quality life. All they want is to raise their kid without bombs and bullets going off around them and, uh, and, and, and going on vacation in the mountains and, like we do. Right. And uh, so uh, America needs to wake up. America needs to wake up on their border policy. We can't keep paying for uh, thugs and gang members to come in over the border. And, uh, uh, and goodness gracious, uh, and I said this earlier to you, Ted, one of the other things, I think Trump needs to get some real law enforcement leadership inside the Department of Homeland Security who are gonna be liaisons to the community. And you don't need the Beltway crowd and we don't need any more generals. We gotta get some real cops that have walked the walk and uh, you know, and we need that experience there. And I think that's one of the things that's lacking. So what do you think, is, is the number one, the number one issue, does it all tie back to the fact that, is it funding and then funding doesn't allow for things that the cop, that cops need, uh, like the helmets, or is it, does it start political and then funding is how they, how it's impacted? What, what do our, what does our local, is it all money driven? Do they need, we need more cops on the force? Do we need better cars? Do we need better protection, better gear? There's all sorts of things that were floating around about how uh, the cops, some of the cops didn't have gear. They didn't have the vests. They didn't have the protection. And I don't know all the terminology, um, but is it because of money it's run out or is it because polit politics designates the money? Well, uh, I think quite frankly, we're very blessed here in Central Florida. If you get the money, spend it. And uh, uh, one of the first things I would make sure that every law enforcement officer has a Kevlar helmet in his car and has an active shooter kit, and they all have their ballistic vests already. Uh, but then we need to be able to fund the agencies that aren't so um, properly funded. And that's why you have surplus programs and things like that. Uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, yeah, I, I remember getting beat up for replacing the 1960 23-ton riot truck, which was an armored vehicle. And uh, World Cup soccer was coming in 94, and since I was going to replace that, uh, wanted to replace that vehicle, then everybody was telling me I was replacing it with a tank and, 
and I, I, I wanted to run over soccer fans and all that. Oh, yeah. Uh, you remember that, Ken? I absolutely remember. And, uh, but then, you know what was funny? All the naysayers, we, uh, Tom Herbert was the chief of police then. We got voted the safest soccer venue when World Cup was hosted by the United States. Why? Because we made the right decisions. We had the right people in place. We had the right equipment. Even the military brought in their GPS system. When, wow. And we were one of the first law enforcement agencies to use what we now have GPS on every smartphone every there one. is. But back in 94, that wasn't available. Why do you think you get so much, or got so much, and probably continue to get pushback on, is it because you're vocal and you just don't, you take no prisoners? What is it? Because I, I, I feel like you're a breath of fresh air. A lot of people put that um, on the, when they were talking on the comments. But do you, what is it about what you're saying that's negative, I guess is what I'm trying to figure out. As somebody who is just a plain citizen, no, no experience in law enforcement or military, why is it that what you say, why does it push so many buttons? Why do they allow it? Because well, he's right, Ray Ortega says. <laughs> well, I, I, I'll be very honest with you. Leaders need to lead. You don't need to be caught up in the politically correct world. You're going to hack some people off. Not everybody's going to like you. Ronald Reagan used to say 65, 35, we're still friends. But uh, b bottom line is, uh, if you want something, you got to stand up. you got to be the... The, the squeaky noise on the wheel, and uh, you need to send that message to Washington, you need to send it to Tallahassee, you need to send it here to Orange County and the city of Orlando. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, you know, uh, as I said earlier, uh, my, my childhood hero was George Patton. Does that kind of give you a hint? <laughs> because, you know, I, I don't like capturing the same real estate twice. Right. And uh, I think we can do a better job in Central Florida and, uh, and we're gonna see where that takes us. And your passions, I love the passion that you have and I think that's palpable. Uh, you can hear it in your voice and on your posts on Facebook and your social media. And when you speak, I mean, it, you can tell that you have the, the heart for uh, making things better. You want things to be better. And so I'm always amazed when somebody like you or somebody who's a vocal proponent who really wants to do the right thing gets the pushback that you have gotten and continue to get. All right, so we're gonna share all of Kevin's uh, information. He's got a website. We didn't get to, you'll have to come back because we didn't get to half the stuff I wanted to talk about. Um, and then we'll, if you, can they follow you on Facebook? Well, it's, I know it's up to about 4,990. Okay, so you can hit follow, and I would encourage you to hit follow on Facebook because Kevin posts some amazing things, um, and they're very eye-opening and very thought-provoking. Um, all right, so any last words of wisdom for them before we head out? Yes, I would say uh, prepare for the hurricane season. I've never been one to say, not be prepared and also be prepared. Uh, hopefully we won't have the violence uh, throughout the nation as we prepare for the midterm elections. But uh, just pay attention, and if you hear something that needs to be reported, the cops have the guts enough to report it. Amen. Thank you, my friend. You are a blessing and appreciate your service. You've done so much for our city, our country. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you on here. Thanks, Ted. I'll Thanks, be buddy. ready to come back. Let me know. I'm, we'll get you some more citrus tea. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have a great day and we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks.